meaning. Our program now is about life. Now I'll begin by showing you three objects. First, a stone, maybe right there. Secondly, a lemon. That's living, but it can't see or think. And thirdly, my beloved cat Ptolemy, who believe me, can see and think, and is a very intelligent cat. But after all, why is the lemon living and the stone not? What is the spark of life? If life appears, will it develop into intelligence? And very importantly, is life unique to Earth or is it widespread all through the universe? At least there are two things to guide us. First, we have absolutely no firm knowledge of life anywhere except on the Earth. And secondly, we are not a bit sure how life here began. There are even suggestions that life was brought here by means of a comet. My first guest now is Dr. Lewis Dartner. Now, you are an astrobiologist. Yes, and yes Some people won't know what astrobiology is. Well, looking at the, the words astrobiology, it, it means the, the life, the biology amongst the stars. Mm -hmm. So astrobiology is a, is a field of science. It's relatively new, actually. But it's all about looking at the possibility of there being life beyond the Earth, looking to extraterrestrial life. So it was my job at University College London. I hunt for aliens. That's, that's what I do. One thing we're not certain about is the origin of life on Earth. So, uh, could you say a bit about that? <laughs> well, this is, this is one of the biggest unanswered questions of, of modern science, of course. There's an enormous number of people trying to address exactly that question. Because if we're talking about life on other planets, yeah. we kind of need to know how it got started here, to, to know what the, the best places to be looking or the best ways of looking for it. And some of these locations that exist still today, right on... Well, again, we, we, we don't really know. There's, there's a massive gap in our understanding. We've got quite a good handle on prebiotic chemistry. We think we understand, at least generally, how you get from things like carbon dioxide, ammonia, up to amino acids and the building blocks of things like DNA. But how you get from things like amino acids to things like DNA, which are, is a chemical that can store digital information, it can store the genetic code and replicate itself, we haven't the foggiest. But it certainly happened here. It, it, and it therefore, on the world like the Earth, going around the star like the Sun, why shouldn't it happen there too? Well, exactly, that's why you're optimistic. And one of the best reasons for thinking that life might be common in the, in, in the universe is that it seemed to happen very, very quickly on the yes, early indeed. Earth. As soon as the environment for the Earth became potentially habitable, as soon as the late heavy bombardment had stopped pummeling and smacking the Earth with the rubble left over from the formation of the solar system, as soon as the oceans had stopped being repeatedly boiled and sterilized, life appears. It, it was incredibly quick and within a couple of hundred million years life has emerged on our planet and it ran, ran with it since then. So the fact that it happened quite quickly would suggest it's a, a likely thing to happen, so it could emerge on other planets as well. So my research um, is in extremophiles that can survive in the coldest, driest places on Earth, so places like the Antarctic dry valleys, which are actually far drier than the Sahara, which is a hot desert. We get very cold, dry deserts as well. I'm working with some bacteria that can survive very, very high doses of radiation. The arch survivalists of, of our planet found life living inside solid icebergs at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So if you look at these extremophiles in general, this broad spectrum and incredible diversity of life on our planet, um, and look at the survival envelope of all life on Earth, the astounding discovery, the thing that's really getting astrobiologists like me excited, is that the survival envelope of life on Earth overlaps with some of the conditions we think or we know exist on extraterrestrial places. So stuff on Earth could survive some of the conditions on Mars or Europa or possibly the upper cloud decks of Venus. It's, it's not all that crazy at all to be talking about extraterrestrial life because we know of terrestrial life that could survive in those situations as well. What about intelligent life then? Well, intelligent life takes a long time to evolve. Yes. For, for the vast majority of Earth's history, we, we, it's been smeared with nothing more than pond scum, yes, like simple bacteria life. You need a planet with the right conditions for very long periods of time to be able to develop intelligence, as far as you understand it. So I personally believe that although there'll be plenty of wet rocks out there in the galaxy, plenty of Earth-like worlds smeared with microbial life, I don't think any of them have got intelligent life on them. I think there might be plenty of forested worlds or worlds with animals, but I don't think there's anything clever and, and cunning out there like us. So far as the solar system is concerned, 
our best chance of finding life is certainly Mars. And we know that thousands of millions of years ago, it was a warmer, wetter world than it is now. So could life have appeared there then? And for that matter, could there be life there now? So far, we've no evidence, and we've talked about it many times on the sky at night. Primitive life there may be. I don't even think so. Intelligent life, certainly not. So in other words, you rather think that Mars is a dead planet? Absolutely dead as a dodo. I don't think we should write off Mars, even now, because if there's, no, if there's never been any life on Mars, that's a very surprising fact, because it looks as though Mars may have been quite benign a few million years ago or a few billion years ago. But I wonder whether life had time to evolve there before conditions became impossible. It begins to look as though life can evolve very rapidly if conditions are at all favourable. Well, we know that there is life in the solar system, and it may even be intelligent. But what about the rest of the galaxy? Plenty of stars there, plenty of planets. Are there worlds like our Earth? And if so, can they support life? Well, we're doing our best to find out. New missions are going up all the time. Chris went to America to find out about one of these missions, NASA's Kepler. The first planet found around a normal star other than our Sun was only discovered in 1995. It took until then because planet hunting is a painful process. The signature of the planet's presence is subtle and easily hidden by changes in the star itself. As a result, the 400 or so planets we've discovered to date are typically large, mostly bigger than Jupiter, and too close to their parent star to make them suitable homes for our kind of life. Three, two, engine start, one, zero, and liftoff. Kepler is the latest mission to hunt for planets. It's staring at millions of stars at once, looking for rocky planets like Earth that have the potential to support life. I visited NASA's Ames Research Center to meet the man who leads the Kepler mission, Bill Barucki. Kepler basically is a space mission where we're trying to look for planets, Earth-like planets, around other stars and find out whether Earths are frequent in our galaxy or very rare. If they're frequent, there's probably a lot of life in our galaxy. If they're rare, then we may be the only extant life. And what we'd like to do is determine that frequency, the frequency of Earth's in a habitable zone, the zone where you could have liquid water on the surface of a planet, where there might very well be conditions conducive to life. We can't find life, but we can find whether planets that could have life are frequent. And of course, Kepler is, is a step along the way where we're trying to understand the extent of life in our galaxy. It's an incredibly difficult challenge. How do you detect them? Uh, basically, the stars are so bright and the planets are so dim, you can't see them directly. So you look at some characteristics of the light from the star itself. So what we do is we look at the brightness of over 100,000 stars constantly. And we're measuring whether the brightness of any of these stars changes. If a star dims by about 1%, that's a Jupiter-sized planet. If it dims a tenth that, that's a Neptune-sized planet. If it's a hundredth of what Jupiter is, in other words, 100 parts per million, that's Earth's size. And if the orbital period is such that it's like a year, like the Earth, it's probably in a habitable zone. Now, cooler stars, and we look at a whole range of stars, uh, have closer in habitable zones, so their, their orbital period might only be a few months. If you look at stars that are hotter than the sun, and there are many such, uh, then you have to look longer. What do we mean by this? Do you need a rocky planet, or is it about the size? What's important? A couple of things are important, certainly the size, but the composition is the most important thing. Because when you find Jupiter's and Neptune's, those are gas giants, basically fluids. You couldn't walk around on them. But when you talk about Earth, you talk about a rocky planet you can walk on, you can have water on. And a super-Earth is something we'll find probably before we find Earth. And that would be a planet maybe one and a half or twice the size of the Earth. Again, rocky. You could walk on it, you could live on it. The first one that we might want to think about is the one is Caro 7b. This is a recent discovery. It's a recent discovery by the Caro ESA mission, and uh, people are delighted to see that they found such a planet. It's a very short period of orbit, however, so it's too hot to have life. But at least it shows these planets exist, and that we should find more of them. Since that interview was recorded late last year, the Kepler team have announced their first planet discoveries. It will take them another year or so to find any Earth-like planets, though. We need to find planets that occupy the same comfortable niche that life does on Earth. Our planet lies in what's called the habitable zone, or Goldilocks zone if you prefer, a place not too hot and not too cold, but rather just right for life. 
Venus, for example, is far too hot, and Mars, at least at the present day, is slightly too cold. Once we find a planet in the Goldilocks zone, scientists and everyone else will clamour to find out what Earth's cousin is like. We've been talking about planets orbiting stars, but we forget to know how far away those stars are, and light travels at a finite speed. Well, the sky at night was first broadcast way back in 1957, how long ago that seems. And since then, our programs have been winging their way into space. Possibly someone out there is listening to an old program right now. Pete and Paul in the garden talking about just how long light takes to get there. If I turn this torch on and point it up into the night sky, the beam of light which leaves the torch is leaving the Earth's surface at the incredible speed of 186,000 miles a second, the speed of light. Now the distance that beam travels over the course of a year is what's known as a light year. Television transmissions travel at the same speed as our light beam, which means it takes them some 10 and a half years to reach here, Epsilon Eridni, which is located some 10 and a half light years away from the Earth. And that means that the Sky at Night program they're most likely to be watching now is our August 1999 edition, which was looking at the total eclipse of the sun. It does look very good at the moment. It's infuriating. It's a bit cloudy. Now, a little over five times further away than Epsilon Eridni is a star known as HD 128311, not really a name which easily trips off the tongue. Now, it's thought that there is a planet around this star which is 54 light years away, and if there are beings on that planet with really sensitive reception equipment, they could pick up the sky at night. Which episode would they be watching? Well, they would have just finished watching the very first episode where Patrick described the comet Aaron Rowland. Now, if they are watching that and they're hooked on the series, I'd like to send them out a message now which will take 54 years to get to them, and that is, please remember to pay your television licence. The other confirmed rocky planet is going around this star, Caro 7, located some 490 light years away from the Earth, which means they won't receive the first episode of The Sky at Night for another 437 years. But if they had a telescope powerful enough and could look back on the Earth, they would see it not as it is now, but as it was in the time of the Tudors, with Henry VIII still on the throne. Not much to see here. Now, while Kuro 7, at 490 light years distance, is a long way away, it's by no means the furthest known system with an exoplanet going round it. That's believed to be a star located in the constellation of Scorpius, estimated to be some 20,000 light years away. Now that places it very close to the galactic centre, where the oldest stars of our galaxy are located. Now just imagine a being on that planet going round that star with a telescope powerful enough to look back at Earth. If it looked through that telescope, it would see our tiny planet covered in ice because it would be looking back in time 20,000 years to the time of the last ice age. Well, Pete, it looks like communicating with extraterrestrials via radio waves is going to take just too long. It's not a very good way of communicating over such vast distances, it is isn't, it? It isn't, no. Well, can you think of anything better? Well, our science really does Well, it will certainly be some time before anyone out there watches this programme. The main organisation looking for life elsewhere is SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And Chris went to see the latest SETI telescope array. Out in the middle of rural California, a bold experiment scans the skies, looking for alien radio signals. This is the Allen Telescope Array. It works by linking together many small dishes, providing the resolution of a much bigger telescope. The array is used for conventional astronomy too, but the team are always alert for that elusive signal. SETI luminary Jill Tata showed me around the array. Built on a shoestring, it has a reassuringly homemade look. Ready? Yep. Got it. Now pull. And here we go. Okay. So now, if you look inside here, what you're looking at is the secondary reflector. So radio waves have bounced off the big dish up there onto the secondary reflector, and then they're focused back wow, here. Wow, look at that. 
Isn't that amazing? I always think about Saturday morning television I used to watch. The Flash Gordon death rays. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that reminds me of. So what is it? Why well, is it that shape? That shape allows it to do two things. One, to capture very long wavelengths down here. Okay. So that's where the half a gigahertz is picked up. It's like a car aerial that works at half a gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And up at this end, um, the, sh the short wavelengths, the high frequencies, the 11 gigahertz, are captured by that part of the aerial. Recently, Jill was in England and came to the sky at night to give me the latest news. Jill, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, safety. Well, you've been involved now for a long time, a large part of your life, haven't you? I have been involved in this project. How did you get involved? By accident, Patrick. I knew how to program a computer that was uh, turned out to be given to someone to do a SETI project when it was obsolete. And what I learned from that was that I lived in a really special time. I was in the first generation of humans that could stop asking the priests and the philosophers what to believe about whether we're alone and actually do an experiment and try and find the answer. Do you personally think there's probably life elsewhere? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I think we should do the experiment to find out. Exactly. So I wonder, if we found them, how could we communicate? Well, I think it will probably be a universal language based on mathematics because technology requires mathematics to do the engineering. Um, we can hope that if someone is taking the trouble to broadcast a deliberate message, that they'll make it anti-cryptographic, that they'll try and help us understand. Have you any real hope of success in the foreseeable future? Well, Patrick, I always keep champagne on ice. I'm very helpful, always. The technology that we're able to use now is getting so much better. We have an exponentially more capable system than we ever had. And so I think within the next few decades, we will have been able to search a few million, 10 million stars, and that might give us a chance. And, you know, because there's so few people in the world doing SETI, I have a passion to get more people involved. And so we are about to start a new SETI project called SETI Quest, where we will publish all of the code that we've been writing all these years as an open source. We'll ask all the engineering students to come up with better algorithms for finding signals. And we'll ask people around the world to use their brains to help us find patterns in noise. And so I hope that by involving the world, we can tell a story of SETI and make people think about us and how we would look relative to some alien species yes. and understand that all Earthlings are the same. This program of searching for extraterrestrial intelligence can help us trivialize the differences among humans. I hope that is so. And make me one promise, Jill. If you find it, and I'm still around, come back to the sky at night and tell us. I'll promise that for sure. Promise? Absolutely, <laughs> sir. The first modern SETI experiment was carried out by Dr. Frank Drake at Green Bank, West Virginia. And in 1965, he joined the sky at night to tell us about it. Uh, from what we know, there are at least 100 billion stars in our own galaxy and so many other galaxies that there is a total of 10 to the 20th, that's 100 million, million, million stars in space. So that we would expect that there are very large numbers of planetary systems, that in many, on many of these planetary systems, life has arisen. And given this very large number of stars with which we start, and the possibilities for life developing in so many of these places, it seems virtually certain that there is intelligent life elsewhere. That was 45 years ago, and today, Frank is still involved in SETI. To calculate the odds of SETI's success, Frank came up with one of the most famous equations in science, the Drake Equation. It's his attempt to work out the number of intelligent civilizations in the universe capable of communicating with us. 
There's at least one species that can send signals across the wastes of space, our own, but there's no evidence yet for anybody else. Well, Dr. Drake, thank you for joining us. I think you're best known as one of the people who first tried to work out what the chances of receiving a signal from another civilization were. What inspired you to, to try and make that effort? Well, this occurred uh, about 50 years ago when we were, had just done the first search for extraterrestrial radio signals. And this led people to ask, oh, what are the chances? Uh, what is it going to take to succeed? And the answer to that requires you to make somehow an estimate of how many civilizations are out there and therefore how far away the closest ones are and how much searching will have to be done before you have any kind of reasonable chance of success. So I sat down and just took into account all the things that bear upon the number of detectable civilizations in our galaxy. Turns out there are seven different things. And that when you multiply your estimates of all of these things together, the end result is our goal the number of detectable technical civilizations in space. So what were the seven things? The seven things are the rate of star formation. Well, that we know. That we know extremely well. Uh, the second one is just the fraction of newly born stars that have planets. More planets, more chances for life. The third thing is the number of habitable planets in each uh, planetary system on average. Okay, so that's uh, three. That's three of them. <laughs> the next one is the probability of life actually developing on a habitable planet. Life appeared on Earth at the earliest time it could have. And so that one is actually pretty well known, even though we've not seen a, a life form on some other planet. Uh, the next one is what fraction of those uh, evolve an intelligent species. This one is still very problematical. And one thing we do know here is that although life appeared quickly on Earth, intelligent life took billions of years to it come took about. Billions of years, and it's because we are a, it, you have to be an extremely complex organism before you can have a brain capable of intelligence. Uh, the next one is the uh, fraction of intelligent species which uh, develop a detectable technology. Uh, on Earth, technology has been developed independently many, many times. Uh, in every case, first, uh, the technology of agriculture, but in a, uh, an instant in cosmic time, on the cosmic time scale, that has developed into automobiles and airplanes and iPods and all of the things we have today. So that, one, that fraction seems to be one with the caveat that the uh, planet has to be suitable for the development of technology. The last one is the length of time a civilization continues to be detectable once it has developed the detectable technology. In our case, we became detectable easily around the year 1950 through the development of radar and also through the development of television. Okay. And these signals are leaking into space. These signals have been leaking into space now for 50, uh, 60 years. And there's a shell around us, 60 light years in diameter, full of evidence for our existence. And people can learn all about us with very little effort from what we have very generously provided them. Disturbingly the by watching our television. <laughs> yes. But we, maybe yes. we should pass what, over that. What, yes, what bad impression do they have of us by now? That shell's continuously growing. Now, 50 years ago, we thought we understood the limits of technology and that what we were searching for would always be there. It was the very powerful so-called carrier signals of television transmissions. A thing which looks like it's definitely the wave of the future is some combination of cable television and direct-to-home, as it's called, television broadcasts from satellites to little dishes on people's houses. Well, it turns out the typical power transmission from the satellites providing television to a whole continent is about 20 watts. The traditional TV stations are a million watts, and all of that power goes into space. So if this becomes the way to deliver television, 100 years from now, the Earth will become very difficult to find. And that makes us stop and say, whoa, you know, does that mean that the typical longevity is 100 years? In which case, the odds of finding it's another civilization small. within our bubble is a very small. Very small. Over the years, plenty of people have speculated about flying saucers, UFOs, alien visitations, and so on. And my old friend, Michael Benteen, joined me to talk about this. 
caught it. <laughs> well, Michael, we used a frisbee, obviously, because it is aerodynamically shaped. And when these things were first reported, they were always known as flying saucers. I'm not quite sure when they changed over to UFO, but a flying saucer it could be. But uh, people who have reported them uh, say that there are other shapes as well, don't they? Yes, indeed. We've got the famous Havana shape from Cuba, the cigar up there, which launches the little saucers, apparently. And then you've got the dumbbell shape. Now, I like that one. And, of course, you have the, the famous lampshade model. Oh, yes. <laughs> Worn on the head. It looks very, very attractive. I think that people will believe anything. What about that famous divorce case? Is it true? It's absolutely true. And I've met the chap concerned. He was an American, and he wrote a book a long time ago now called Aboard a Flying Saucer. And he described his adventures aboard a craft from the planet Venus, piloted by a beautiful lady whose name, I think, was Mrs. Aura Rains. Apparently, he had a very good time indeed. His book came out as non-fiction, a true adventure. And um, his wife promptly sued him for divorce, cited the lady from Venus, and she won. <laughs> First interplanetary scandal in history. It's absolutely fabulous. Well, flying saucers are still with us, and Pete and Paul have brought along some very interesting specimens. Yes, look at these. Aren't these marvellous? I have here a model of George Adamski's ah, yes. very early flying saucer, seen in the 1950s. It looks a bit retro now, doesn't it? It do definitely looks retro. Like Imagine it, if that yeah. actually landed. It would be so disappointing, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it really would. <laughs> the next one, uh, very reminiscent of the first alien abduction case, if you believe in that sort of thing. This is the Betty and Barney Hill spacecraft, oh, which yes. snatched them up from the road uh, when they were on their way home from a holiday in Montreal, Canada. In the yes, night. Can I? That's Right, the uh, aliens uh, showed Betty Hill a star map, which she revealed under hypnosis, uh, and it showed the Zeta II reticular star system. It's rather small. The it's bigger inside. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, right up to date, we have the flying saucer as seen by Billy Mir. I uh, like that one, actually. It is, uh, this is also known as the people who back-engineer these things, mm. of course, as the sports model. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, quite a sleek-looking craft. You wouldn't want to own a flying saucer like that. That, that, that really a looks like a flying saucer should look like, it's, actually, it's doesn't pretty it? In good. your mind's eye. But, of course, people do see weird things in the night sky. They're actually quite natural, don't they? Well, the, the term UFO means unidentified flying object. And, of course, if you see something and you can't identify it, then it is unidentified. And I've seen loads of things in the night sky being outside, which I haven't been able to identify, but then I've found out what they are. So they're no longer UFOs. Now, these include things like, a, say, a bright planet down close to the horizon. Venus. As it's flickering away. Uh, it is yeah. easy to mistake it. And you get lots of calls coming in from people that don't Sorry, recognize. Sirius very often, too. Sirius, of course, flashes these bright, brilliant colours. So that can be mistaken as well. Now, other bright things are like the International Space Station. It's a oh, classic yes. example. Oh, yes. It's yeah. so bright and moves across the sky. A lot of people see it. They don't know what it is, and they think it's a, a, an it unidentified is, flying object. It is quite spooky, isn't it, the way it sort of brightens up as it reaches the zenith and then dims back down there? It is very odd remarkable. indeed. The, the thing which has really almost threw me once actually mm. going outside, and another artificial satellite, but this time it was a trio of satellites, ah, just bright enough yeah, to be able yes. to see with the naked eye, moving across in formation together. That was qu actually quite freaky to see. But uh, you have had a UFO experience yourself, haven't you? Oh, I've been in the <laughs> way. So, and um, a whole crop of flying saucers came towards me. My 15-inch reflector. So, the Martians have arrived at last. I guess I <laughs> couldn't see them. I absolutely baffled. What was it? Um, pollen. Oh no! <laughs> 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 seen out of focus. <laughs> I, I saw actually a very strange sight um, a while back. It was a triangular cloud, and triangular I, cloud. I was I was quite perplexed by that, so I took a photograph of it as I would do, and then left it for a bit, and then came back a couple of hours later, and it was still there. And I took another photograph of it, and it turned out after I did a bit of research into it, it was a fuel dump from a satellite. Really? Oh. So it was just up there in space, glowing away. But my all-time favourite UFO, partly because I've launched them from our own back garden, is the Chinese lantern. Ah, yes. These are remarkable and things. And they're becoming more common now. Yeah, people don't fall for it anymore. It's a bit of a shame. Actually, but there, there were quite a few reports, actually, of, a, of a meet, the people reporting a meteor shower, and they actually turned out to be Chinese lanterns. So it's just misidentification of things. Pure coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far, Sadie has been totally unsuccessful. Nothing but an eerie silence. Can it be that there really is nobody up there listening out? Well, Chris has been talking to a cosmologist who has very definite ideas about it all. It's tempting to put SETI's failure to detect an alien signal down to bad luck. 
But cosmologist Paul Davies, although he's a staunch supporter of SETI, thinks there's a more troubling reason why all we've heard so far is an eerie silence. So when we talk about life in the universe, there are many unknowns. Um, which of them do you think is the most important? The quantity that we understand least is the probability that life will emerge on an Earth-like planet if you have one. Uh, that number could be anywhere from uh, very nearly zero uh, to very nearly one. Uh, the error bars are enormous. We know it's not zero, of course. We know it's not strictly zero, but uh, people will often use a very silly argument. They'll say, well, the, the universe is so big, it's so vast, there's got to be life out there somewhere. And it's a silly argument for the following reason. If we take the entire observable universe, that is the universe out as far as we can in principle see, uh, then there might be something like 100 billion billion Earth-like planets in that volume. Now 100 billion billion sounds like a really big number, one followed by 20 zeros. You know, surely, uh, even if the chances of life forming by the random shuffling of molecular building blocks are really, really tiny, there's going to be many planets out there where it will have happened. Well, it just isn't true. If you imagine having a soup of amino acids uh, with everything there and you just allow it to shuffle and shuffle and shuffle, the chances of getting a particular protein is like uh, one followed by 130 zeros to one against. Now, if that's the way life occurred on Earth, we will be unique. This will be the only planet, even given the vastness of the universe. So that, that argument just doesn't wash. That has huge implications for SETI. Uh, I've always been a supporter of SETI, even though I think that the chance of success is exceedingly small, because it forces us to think about things we should be thinking about anyway. What is life? What is intelligence? What is the destiny of mankind? Remember, when we're looking for alien civilizations, we're really looking at the future of human civilization. We're thinking, well, what might it be like on Earth in another thousand years, in another million years, in another 10 million years? You know, what lies in store for us? Because that's what we're assuming is happening out there. So uh, we're, we're really searching for human destiny mirrored in the stars, is the way I like to put it. And when you put it like that, that sort of suggests the paradox I inherent in current SETI searches, because we're looking for the future of human civilization with the technology that we use today. In my view, rather than looking for messages crafted for mankind and deliberately beamed at us, which I just don't think is a credible notion, the best way that we could hope to pick up anything using radio is to look for beacons, because we can imagine a civilization, say, towards the center of the galaxy that might have been around for hundreds of millions of years, uh, to have built a, a beacon like a lighthouse. It would sweep the plane of the galaxy, and this thing would just go bleep as it comes round. Well, it might go bleep bleep or something a little bit more interesting. Uh, but it would do this, you know, once a year, once every 10 years. I don't know what it is. But as a form of advertising their presence. Right, so right. So what we really want is a set of instruments to just stare towards the center of the galaxy, which is where most of the stars are. But the SETI program, as is currently set up, uh, d does not really do that. It's not well, well set up for these transient events. Could we ever see traces of civilization directly? One scenario is that uh, not only are there other inhabited planets, but there will have been waves of colonization uh, across the galaxy. And who knows, there could have been a wave of uh, colonization or at least exploration that passed through our solar system in the past. Now, a lot of people are fixated on this idea, oh, you know, ET came to visit within historical times. Sure. That is, of course, absurd when you look at the duration of cosmic history. Mm -hmm. uh, there could have been advanced civilizations in our galaxy billions of years ago. Supposing an expedition had come through our solar system 500 million years ago, how would we know? Even if they blundered around and made a mess, would any of that detritus remain today? Well, if we think very carefully, the answer could be yes. If they had uh, uh, dug craters on the moon or somewhere where erosion is rather small, we might notice it if the shape was peculiar. They may have fiddled around with the biosphere. They may have uh, uh, created microorganisms to help them with mineral refining or something of that sort. And so we might see a trace uh, in the genomes of microorganisms. They may even have left a message for us in the genomes of microorganisms. We know that uh, DNA is a great 
place to store information, the information in your DNA, my DNA, some of that information's been around for three and a half billion years. And passed down from generation right, to right, generation. Right. Uh, so it's much better than leaving an obelisk there that isn't going to survive uh, too long. You, you uh, encode it biochemically. So we could start looking in genomes. Uh, it, maybe the message is in the genome, not in the, in the sky. Uh, now, of course, all of these ideas are incredibly fanciful. I mean, this is science fiction we're talking about, but what I really want to do is to make people aware that we could see a signature of intelligence, of alien intelligence, almost anywhere, in almost any science and almost anywhere in the universe, and we mustn't just be fixated on this idea that it's got to be a radio signal coming our way. Life has been present on our Earth almost since the beginning of our planet's long story, more than four billion years ago. Yet only in the last 50 years has our technology advanced enough to make us visible to the rest of the cosmos. And things are happening now that would have been sheer science fiction only a few years ago. As we've heard, the odds of there being a civilization out there whose signals we can detect are small. And that makes it very difficult to assess whether we're truly alone in the universe. That said, there are likely to be many thousands of planets spread throughout the galaxy. And despite the arguments against it, I still believe that there must be at least one other place out there where life is flourishing. You know, Chris, in this program, we've talked to a good many people, all of whom have different views, but they're making progress on all kinds of fronts. We're getting forward, and sooner or later, those fronts are going to gel, at least I think so. What do you feel? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I, the easiest way to see that, I think, is to go back 20 years. Yes. 20 years ago, we didn't know of any planets beyond our own solar system. Yeah. SETI was fairly moribund. They were doing some radio stuff, but there was nothing like the Allen Telescope Array. No. The, even the biologists, who are now getting more confident about how life can have started. If you go back to Lewis, who you talked to at yes. the start of the programme, the idea that you could do experiments in the laboratory that have direct bearing on this question as to whether there's life elsewhere. It's, I think, quite impressive. And then, of course, look at Mars. 20 years ago, Mars was a dead place. No one thought there was any possibility of recent water. Europa's oceans were a hypothesis, but yes. there wasn't much evidence. Enceladus was a boring moon going around Saturn. And so we gained places within the solar system. When you put all of this together, what we're doing is making the problem much worse for ourselves. We're seeing planets, we're understanding life, but we still don't have the evidence we need to say, yes, there's intelligent there's life no out there. There's no evidence at all. In a, in a way, in the solar system, we found more and more evidence that there's no life of any intelligence at all. Beyond, probably the chances there have increased. Well, that's true. It's we this... now know there are so many planets and so many Earth. And I can't take the idea that of all the Earth-like planets, we are the only one with intelligent life. I can't take it. We're maybe five, ten years from pointing at a star in the night sky and saying, not only do I know that that star has planets, not only do I know that one of those planets is like the Earth in that it has oceans and it has a rocky surface, but I know that there is the signature of at least primitive life. And I think that changes our whole view of the cosmos. Once we can point to one other place... One case, all we want. Absolutely, just one. Chris, thank you very much. Well, in this programme, we've talked about the matter in all its aspects. Is there life there? Is it intelligent? Can we ever contact it? Will the eerie silence ever be broken? Well, I don't know. I have a sort of feeling that it will. And finally, we may at last find out the answer to what we really want to know. Are we alone in the universe? <laughs>